studying about Abraham, the man whom God called, a man whose name sounds familiar to the Jews, to the Christians, and uh, to the Muslims. But very many people Jews, Christians, and Muslims do not know why the name of Abraham is dear to God and the relationship of Abraham with God was so dear and um, the Jews are still receiving benefits today and believers today are called children of Abraham by faith and Jesus Christ came in the natural as of the seed of Abraham. Now we're going to study from the call of this man because there are many things in his call, in his response and in his life that are applicable to you and to me today. Genesis chapter 11, the last two verses introduce us to the family circle and to the relationship of Abraham. The verses read, And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth with them from all, all of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Here we're introduced to the family circle and relationship of Abraham. Originally his name was called Abraham, meaning the exalted or high father. When, as yet, he had not become a man, he was just a child, and he was given that name, apparently prophetic, that he will be a father that will be great, exalted, honored, and high. 
But after he knew God, God himself brought his name to Abraham, that is, father of multitude, that his name may be suitable to the promise God was giving him and to the covenant that the Almighty was making with him. His father's name was Terah. That means, in their language, delay. And obviously, from Bible records, he delayed to go out of the land of his nativity. And Abraham also apparently was delayed to answer the call of God. But we know more than this about Terah, the father of Abraham, in Joshua chapter 24. This detail is given, and it's a very useful detail to the family background of Abraham, so that every one of us will know he was not born a good person. Nobody is ever born a good person. He was not born a friend of God. Nobody is ever born a friend of God. He was not born a covenant person with God. Nobody is born having covenant relationship with God. He was not born a believer in God. Nobody is a born believer. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Joshua chapter 24 verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, What is God saying? Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even terror, even terror, the father of Abraham and the father of of Neko and they served other gods. So then, Terah was an idol worshiper, like father, like children. He brought up his children, including Abraham, in the way of idol worship. So Abraham was born in that ancient city or of the Chaldees and he was among idolatrous people. He grew up within the idolatrous culture, idolatrous way of life, idolatrous worship before God called him. In fact, he had been in this idolatrous way for many, many years because he did not receive the call to repentance until the age of 75. And from Bible records, Abraham was not the only one that was called from idolatrous background. There is a great man that we have all known about. His name is called Gideon. When God wanted to bring great deliverance, to his people Israel from the hand of the enemy, the Midianites that were oppressing them. He chose a man called Gideon. You would have read before, no doubt, about the 300 members in the army of Gideon. But that man Gideon, again, uh, had an idolatrous father, lived in an idolatrous town, in an environment that was completely opposed to the way, the plan, and the worship of the only true God. If you have been an idol worshipper, your parents have been idol worshippers, yet that will not stop God from reaching down to you, calling you, and wanting you to come to repentance. And if you will answer the call like Abraham did, if you will answer the call like Gideon did, God will receive you because he rejects none that comes to him. 
Judges chapter 6, from verse 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal, that was an idol, that thy father has, and cut down the groove that is by it. God was telling Gideon here, forsake the religion of your father. God was teaching him against his father's religion. And God always does that. He teaches in his word against traditional religion, against anti-Christian religion, against the um, atheistic religion, maybe of your father or of your mother or of your people. The message of God to everyone that is from idolatrous background is come out. Throw down the idol. Reject the idol. Refuse to serve that idol. Repent and call upon the name of the Lord and say, I will not worship idols anymore. This Gideon did. Verse 27. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants. That's very important to you and to me. It's good to accept and receive the call alone but it is also good to make the call known to other people abraham did not and um, just go out alone you have read the story he took his own wife he took lot gideon here in wanting to destroy the idol stopping idol worship he took 10 servants you have heard before of rahab rahab knew the call of god again from a sinful background adulterous background a background of harlot and prostitutes and yet when she came to the god of israel she told her father and her father's household cornelius did not take the lord alone when the lord told him send to joppa and call unto peter he'll show you the way of the lord he sent unto peter and before peter came he collected all his household together the Philippian jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? And he was told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved and thine house. And then we are told that Paul and Silas spoke the word of God to that Philippian jailer and to his house. And all the household received the Lord and they were baptized. So then it means like you should say, like Joshua, as for me and my house, as for me, my father, my mother, my children, my husband, my wife, my co-workers, my tenants, as for me and my employees and my mates and my servants, we will serve the Lord. Don't study that Bible alone. Study with other people. Don't come alone. Come with other people. Tell others about it. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. If you have experienced some fear before, you see you are not alone. Sometimes when you are coming for the first time to listen to the word of God, some slight fear or great fear may grip your heart, but don't let that fear stop you. Come fearing and trembling if you have to fear. You may fear that what if um, my boss or my messengers or my wife or my husband or my people will know I am afraid. Come with that fear and do the work of God. Do the will of God. Be obedient to the Lord anyhow. Even though there may be some fear, there may be some trembling, do it all the same. Verse 28, and uh, Gideon did. He went, um, he, he, he went across and against idolatry. 
It was not without opposition. You're coming here. You're receiving the call of God. Maybe with some opposition, with some persecution. But the Lord is watching over you. The Lord will protect you. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar bear was cast down, and the group was cut down that was by eight. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he has cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the groove that was by age. That's why I said, you're coming to the Bible study. May make you to face opposition, but you are not alone. The angels of God are watching over you. Because they'll give his angels charge over you to protect you. And no harm will happen to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Some people fear if we come in the night to a Bible study like this, is it not difficult outside in the night? No, we do not fear the harrows by day or the pestilence that walketh about by night. We are protected under the blood of Jesus Christ. The lion may roar, but the lion cannot bite. Because though you pass through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll go without fear. Because the rod and the staff of the Lord, they comfort you. The Lord is watching over you. How about enemies? Well, the enemies cannot harm you. How about uh, the threatening in the place of work? They cannot do anything. They can roar. They cannot bite. And here we are told in verse 31, And Joah said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it is yet morning. If he be a god, if he is a powerful idol, if it is not that he only has eyes and cannot see, having ears but cannot hear, having hands but cannot handle, having legs and cannot walk, if it's a real God who can do evil or do good, if it be a God, let him plead for himself. Because one, Gideon, has cast, him, has cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubel, saying, Let Baal plead against him. Because he has thrown down his altar. And Baal could not do anything against him. When some people want to come out of idolatry, they are fearing, maybe the village God will do something against me. No, the village God cannot help you and it cannot harm you. The village God cannot do evil to you and the village God cannot do good unto you. The village God has no ears, has no eyes, has no heart has no understanding. Behind that village God is the devil. And when you came into the kingdom of God, you walked on the head of the devil to come into the kingdom of God. And after you have defeated the devil, coming into the kingdom of God, that devil is completely and forever defeated on your behalf. And the dumb idol, the deaf idol, and the blind idol, and the heartless idol cannot do anything against you. In Ruth chapter 1, Ruth was a figure, a woman that came to the Lord again out of idolatrous background. Ruth chapter 1. You know the story before, I suppose. Uh, Nehemiah had been a woman that was sorrowful. She had come across two daughters of the Moabites. They were married unto her own sons. Those sons were dead. And um, the husband of Naomi had also died. And now Naomi wanted to go back to his own land. Two ladies from the idolatrous background wanted to go back with her. 
But um, she said, no. Do I have any husband to give unto you? So she said that um, they must go back. And um, we're told, Opa went back. At Opa went back, let us see the language of Naomi. I'm reading now from verse 14. Ruth chapter 1. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Opa kissed her mother in law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law to your people and to your gods. But this is a decision of a person coming out of idolatry saying, No, I will not serve Satan. No, I will not serve idols. No, I will not follow the religions of the world. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, not to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. That's consecration. That's decision. No matter where they transfer or take the Bible study to, Bible study to I will be there. Take it to mile 12, I'll be there. Take it to Badagri, I will be there. Anywhere that you go, I will go. And it doesn't matter if you'll make this Bible study two days in the week, three days in the week, four days in the week. Anytime you are having a meeting, I will be there. You are calling on the name of Jesus. You are teaching sound doctrine. You are teaching the word of God. I have come out of idolatry. I will be there. And entreat me not to leave thee. This was a woman that will never be discouraged. Or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And, where, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also, if aught but death part me and uh, thee. That's a woman who has made a decision to serve the Lord, to follow the Lord, and she was not going to go back. In Acts chapter 17, we also find some New Testament people that came to God and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ out of idolatrous background. So it will not be strange if you are coming to God and you are separating yourself from all idols and you are saying, I give myself to God. I will not serve idols anymore. And from this day, I am going to be serving the Lord. I repent. I turn away from idolatrous worship. And I'm going to serve the Lord through Jesus Christ from this very day. Others did that before you and they were blessed. And if you do that today, you'll be blessed of the Lord. Acts 17. I'm reading from verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of my seal and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. There are many people who are worshipping, but they have never heard the voice of that God. They have never felt the joy of serving that God. That God has never answered their prayer. They have never felt his touch. They serve the unknown God. How many sincere people in the Jehovah's Witnesses are serving the unknown God? 
They've never seen him. They've never known him. They've never heard from him. They've never prayed to him. He has never answered their prayer. He's a stranger to them. And they just feel if they do the best they can, if they sell how many materials they can sell, maybe, perhaps, maybe they'll be able to see him at last. And there is no hope of heaven. They feel that it's in this dusty land they are going to remain forever. The unknown God they are serving. How many Muslims are serving the unknown God, trying the best they can? If for adventure, maybe at the end of life, there will be something for them. They are very sincere, they are very diligent, they are very serious about it, and they will spend their money, spend their strength, and do everything. But they pray, but their prayers are not answered. So the unknown God that they are serving, and how many people who are, who are, who are worshipping on the seaside, and they are praying, rolling on the ground, burning candles, wearing white garments, doing the best they can if they can see God if they can see God but they do not know that God they are serving the unknown God and if somebody will tell them if somebody will tell them that you who are serving the unknown God whom ye therefore ignorantly worship him declare I unto you how many people have gone into secret calls fraternities, secret orders because they are searching for the unknown God they know there is a God somewhere where is he they don't know how to reach him they don't know how to talk to him they don't know how to knock at the gates of heaven at the doors of heaven they don't know but they say we are searching for him we are searching for him and many people even on their deathbed they still say I have sought for God all my life I have not found him now I must die and I don't know where to go if you have been in a situation like that, whom you ignorantly worship, him will declare unto you tonight, his name is God, his creator, is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ has come to reveal him. He is no more the unknown God. He is known to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. God that made the world and all things therein, seen his Lord of heaven and earth dwelt, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And those who heard this message, they were told in verse 30, and the times of this ignorance, God winged that. But now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Look at verse 34. How be certain men clave unto him and believed. They came out of idolatry. They came out of idolatry. And that is what you can do tonight. If you have been serving the idol of the twin babies, Maybe you are a twin and the idol has been made for you. Come out of it. Break that wood. It's not ordinary wood. Don't let anybody deceive you and say, that wood is your second. That's not your second. It cannot talk. It cannot see. It cannot walk. It cannot speak. It cannot hear or understand. Come out of that. And in Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts, brought their books together, and burnt them before all men. And they counted the price of them, and found eight, fifty thousand pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God, and prevailed. In chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. That was the Lord talking to Abraham, seeing that he was among sinners, and he was a sinner himself. He was a man with unclean lips, living among people of unclean lips. He was an idol worshiper, living among idol worshippers. He was a sinner, living among sinners. 
his ways were evil. And the ways of people around him were evil. And the Lord was calling him a call to repentance, a call to separation. And we are told about this call in Acts chapter 7, verses 2, 3, and 4. Acts chapter 7 makes us to understand that the Lord had called him before. Just like this may not be the first message you are hearing about coming out of sin. And I am praying that you will take your decision tonight to come out entirely. And come to serve the Lord. Come to worship the Lord because there is joy. There is blessing. There is profit and benefit in serving the Lord. Acts chapter 7 from verse 2. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The Lord of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charan and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country. Do you know sometimes God cannot talk to you until you are out of your country. Sometimes God cannot talk to you until you are out of um, that drinking bar. Sometimes God cannot talk to you or God cannot reach out to you and reveal his plan to you and explain everything to you until you are out of the evil company. The Lord told him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land that I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. That means that he had received the call before his father died. He came out, but he did not fully come to where the Lord wanted him to come to. Then uh, we're told in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2. And this is important to you and I. Important to everyone. The call of God is personal. Don't wait until your friends agree to serve the Lord. You take your decision to serve the Lord. Don't wait until your parents decide and agree to serve the Lord. You take the Lord, receive the Lord into your heart first. And then you'll be praying for your parents to come to the Lord. Don't wait until your wife comes to the Lord before you receive the Lord. You receive the Lord and then make effort by living a clean life, a honest life, and a faithful life, and a prayerful life as well to introduce your wife to the Lord. And don't wait until your husband agrees with everything. Take a step of faith. And by prayer and faith, later your husband will have to follow. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone. I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. In your Bible, you should underline that word alone. That's the way God always calls you. And don't allow people around you to remove that personal call. Even though you and your husband, you are coming together, salvation is still personal. Even though you and your wife are coming together, salvation is still personal. Even though friends are coming together, salvation is still personal. It is not the family religion, no. It is not the community faith or the society faith, no. It's not the national religion or the national repentance, no. It is personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what comes. Let's see the language of Jesus Christ himself about this. And this that Jesus Christ said is still fresh today. It is still what Jesus is requiring from every one of us today. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll need to be personal. 
after you have come to the Lord Jesus Christ to be sanctified, you will need to be personal. After you have been sanctified to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will need to be personal. After you have got these experiences, Christian experiences in your life, uh, to consecrate your life, to do anything, whatever, it is still personal. When you are hearing the call of God to work for God, don't wait for friends. Don't wait for a neighbor. Don't wait for the soul winner. Don't wait for your convert. It is still personal. Matthew chapter 10. Verses 37 and 38. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That is, he who hears the word of God. And then he says, before I respond to that message, what will my father think? What will my mother say? That person is not worthy of Christ. He's not worthy of the name of Christ. That is, he's not worthy of being called a Christian. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who will say, well, if I'm going to accept this call of God, the call to repentance, what, might, what will my children say? If you consider that you are not worthy of the name of Christ. What will my relatives say? If you think about that, you are not worthy of Christ. What will my sons in law, daughters in law, what will they say? You are not worthy of Christ. He that taketh not his cross. Everyone has a cross to take. And that's why we sang, I my cross have taken. Wife will not take it for you. Husband will not take it for you. Children will not take it for you. I, my cross, have taken all to leave and to follow thee. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Luke chapter 14. And you can begin to look at these verses. Since you got married. Hasn't consecration become family consecration? And yet you know there is nothing like that before God. If you are going to consecrate, it's going to be ultimately, it's going to be personal. And when the judgment is going to take place on the last day, judgment is going to be personal. It's not going to be family judgment. It's not going to be national judgment. It's going to be personal judgment because everyone must give an account of himself. Luke chapter 14, from verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man, not if any family, not if any society, not if any school, if any man come to me and hate not his father, hate, yes, in comparison, that's what it will look to your father. When your father says, don't go to the uh, Christian assembly. And you say, I will go. Well, he can't see that you hate him now. When your mother says, don't receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And you say, I will. I'll give my life to the Lord. Your mother will call it hatred. And so Jesus is using the language of your father and the language of your mother. And he says, if any man come to me. And hate not his father and mother and his wife. That means hate his wife. That's what your wife will say. If um, you've been sinning together. If you have been making gain of money through sin. And now you want to take a stand for the Lord. You want to repent. You want to call upon the Lord. Your wife will take it as hatred. If you have been talking all the time and gossiping about pastor, about a deacon, about denominations, about employers, about everybody, but now you repent from all that and your wife brings the gossip out and you say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to take part in that conversation anymore. Well, she'll count it as hatred. Well, Jesus said, if she counts it as hatred, don't argue that it is not hatred, just keep quiet and serve the Lord. And hate not his children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. And his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross, and that cross is heavy, 
because it's not the it's not the thing that ladies put in their neck. That one is not the cross Jesus is talking about. It's not the one they put in the ear. That that's not the one Jesus is talking about. That one is for enjoyment. That one is for a beauty. That one is for makeup. But this one is for suffering. This one is for self denial. This one is for ridicule. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, not after man, not after denomination. Many people who feel they want to serve the Lord, they are making a mistake. They go from one idol unto another idol. They serve the denomination. But you are not serving denomination. You should not be serving denomination. You should go after Christ. That's the Savior. We have said it before. Denomination does not save. Ministry does not save. I cannot save. Nobody can save. Only Jesus can save. It's not even the catechism. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So, follow the Lord. You might need to forsake many things. We are called. Like Abraham has been called, we are called to separation. But separation in four areas. Abraham was called to separation. Separation warm. Separate from his country. But that was not all. Two, separate from his kindred, his relatives. But that was not all. Three, to separate from his father's house. But that was not all. He was called to separate from his father's idolatrous religion and worship. One, his country. Two, his kindred. Three, his father's house. Four, his father's religion. And we are called to separation in four different areas. One, separation from sin. Two, separation from idolatrous worship. Three, separation from the world. For separation from anything that does not bring glory to God. About our separation from sin. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7. This must be very clear and it must be clear cut. There must not be any doubt about it in the heart of your friend. In the heart of your co-workers or in the mind of those who know you, of your acquaintances, they will know so and so as I received the call to separation, separation from sin. Isaiah 55 verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way, that's separation. And the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Job chapter 11. Still seen from the Bible that we are called to separation. One, separation from sin. Two, separation from idolatrous worship. Three, separation from the world. Four, separation from anything that does not bring glory to God. And if your separation is not complete in these four areas, then you need to make it complete tonight. Job chapter 11, we're reading from verse... Reading from verse 13. If thou prepare thine heart... And stretch out thine hands toward him. If iniquity, that's another word for sin. It's another word for evil. It's a word for wrongdoing. If iniquity or sin or wrongdoing be in thine hand, put it far away. Far away. Away from your body. There are sins committed in the body. Away from your room. There are sins that you commit in the privacy of your room. Away from your place of work. Away from your environment. Put it far away. And let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacle. That's complete, total separation from sin. 
Job chapter 22. As to our call to separation, separation from sin. Here we read in chapter 22 of Job. Reading from verse 23. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Put it far away. Put it far away. But I said it's not only separation from sin. It's also separation from idolatrous worship. In Ezekiel chapter 14. Reading there in verse 6. Hear the Lord specifically says in clear tone unmistakable language that we are to depart from idolatry or idols Ezekiel 14 6 therefore say unto the house of Israel thus says the Lord God this God talking to you thus says the Lord God Repent and turn yourselves from your idols. Turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. First John. That's in the New Testament, near the end of the New Testament. First John, chapter 5, verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, new converts, keep yourself. That means you have already separated from idols, but keep yourselves separated from idols. Remember, the idols are still in the villages. Keep yourselves from idols. The idols are still in the family. Keep yourselves from idols. The idol festivals are still observed in your community. Keep yourselves from idols. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. From verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The moment you are joined to unbelievers or joined to idols, you are separated from God and from Jesus Christ. You have to divorce um, a man before you can go and marry another man. And if you are marrying one man today, it's an indication that you have run away and you have divorced a man that you had before, if you had one before. And if you are joined to idols today or any day, it is an indication you have run away from the Lord. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers because when you are you are not joined with the Lord. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? That's an idol. What part has he that believeth with an infidel? Don't worship the idols with them. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? No agreement. None whatever. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out. Separation from idols, from idolatrous worship. Well, the community may still be doing it. They may be dancing around that idol. They may be having festival. They may be distributing food concerning that idol, concerning that idolatrous worship. But you come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean sin. Idol is the unclean sin. And I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Reading from verse 9 to verse 12. These are things connected with idol worship. 
that when you come to the Lord, you completely separate from them. Deuteronomy chapter 18 from verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God givest thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Don't read it in books to learn of the ways of idol worship. In the ways those who are not Christians worship their false gods. Don't even try to know it. Don't even try to see how they worship so that you don't go in the way of their, in the way of their abominations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Don't sacrifice your children because of the fire god. No, or that uses divination. Don't go to those who are foretelling the future, either through dreams, or through the um, sand on the plate, or through any oracle. Those who use divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter. Those who make incantations, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer those who consult the dead for all that do these these things are an abomination unto the Lord and because of these abominations the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee you are to abstain from all these abominations but after you have separated from sin and you have separated from idols, there's still another separation. Separation from the world and worldliness. Romans chapter 12. And before the Lord can count you as a real child of his, you have to separate in all these four areas. You have to call upon the Lord and say, I will no more go in these ways anymore. And anyone who has been influencing you to go in those ways, you will have to take your stand against their influence. Be they father, mother, wife, husband, children, uh, sisters, brothers, relatives, neighbors, or friends. Anyone influencing you to go in the ways Forbidden by God, you'll have to take your stand against their influence. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Fashions of the world. Patterns of the world. Systems of the world. Be not conformed unto this world. That's another form of separation God is requiring from you. In James Chapter 1, verse 27. This verse tells you that until you separate from the defilement of the world, your religion is vain, unacceptable in the sight of God. Because it says pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. It is not the ministry that keeps you unspotted from the world. It is not the pastor that keeps you unspotted from the world. It is yourself by decision, by determination, by dedication, by prayer, by giving yourself to the Lord and turning yourself away from all those things that You'll keep yourself unspotted from the world. In chapter 4 of James, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Friendship of the world is enmity with God. So if you're a friend of the world, going in the ways of the world, Dancing like they dance in the world. Dancing to the tunes of uh, the world. Following the pattern of the world. A friend of the world is 
an enemy of God. Whosoever therefore, pastor or evangelist, whosoever therefore, teacher or prayer warrior, whosoever therefore, the person who is speaking in tongues, or the one who says, well, I'm born again, whosoever therefore is a friend of the world, is the enemy of God. The enemy of God. Come here from among them. First John chapter 2, reading from verse 15 up to verse 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You check up your life. If you've been born again for some time, except you are putting this body under, like Paul the Apostle said he did to his body, except you are not con considering this body like Abraham considered not his body, except you are considering Jesus like Hebrews chapter 12 tells us to consider Jesus Christ, except you are considering that you have a home far beyond the blue, far beyond the sky. Like we are told in Hebrews chapter 11. Except you are considering that your home is not here. And that you have a home, a country, a place whose foundation and builder is God. Except you are considering that your heart, your mind will be going back into the world. But we are told here. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There are not people who tell us, once you are saved, you were saved 10 years ago, you are always saved. And there are many of those people who love the world today. And they love the things of the world. They dance, they drink, they smoke, they commit adultery, they commit fornication, they commit sins. All the works of the flesh are manifest in their lives. And they say, we were saved 10 years ago, and we are always saved, and we will ever be saved? No. That's the doctrine of man. That's not the word of God. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. Then if you love them, you are not of the Father. But it's of the world. And the world passes away. And the lost thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Only those people, they abide forever. But we've been told there are four areas we must separate. Separate from sin. Separate from idolatrous worship. Separate from the world. And then separate from anything that will not bring glory to the Lord. We are told whatsoever therefore ye do in world. Or did do all to the glory of God, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, do all to the glory of God. You are separated to fulfilling the glory of God in your life. We are told the same thing in Colossians chapter 3 that all we do, all we say, all we practice must bring glory to God. Colossians chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by, by him. In Romans chapter 8, reading there from verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Carnally minded. If you are minded on things that uh, will, will suit and please the flesh, things that are not glorifying to God, that is death. But to be spiritually minded, that's completely opposed to be carnally minded, to being carnally minded. To be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. So there is no joy in saying, I am only a carnal Christian, then you are an enemy of God. 
I am not of the mind of Christ. I don't like the things belonging to God. I have a tendency of loving and liking things that will not bring glory to God. Then you are carnally minded. And the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why you have to separate yourself from sin, from idolatrous worship, from the world, and from anything, anything, anything that will not bring glory unto the Lord. This is demanded by the Lord in Scripture. And we are compelled by the Holy Spirit to separate from all worldly influences, worldly uh, distractions, and worldly alliances. Of course, when anybody becomes a Christian, he is no longer a member in a fraternal organization, in a secret society, in the lodge, no matter the name of that lodge, or in secret orders, or in cults. He dissolves all partnership with, all, with unbelievers. And uh, our faith will always separate us from the world, or the world will separate us from the faith. But we're thankful to God because when Abraham had the call, the call to separate, he separated. He did not um, confer with flesh and blood. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord gave a promise to him. The Lord always gives promises out. He doesn't call us for fun or for nothing. He said, I will, be with thee, I, I will make thee a great nation. And whatever God is promising you, nobody can do it for you. Nobody could have made Abraham a great nation. Nobody could have done it. There were many things militating against him, working against him. His wife was barren. And Satan could not change that condition. He did not know how he will ever have a single child, not to talk of having a whole nation. And whatever God has promised you, only God can fulfill that promise. The pastor cannot. Sometimes God has given us a promise and we're looking for the pastor to fulfill it. He cannot. Sometimes God has given us a promise and we're looking to mommy or daddy to fulfill it. He ca they cannot. Sometimes God has given you a promise to promote you, to bless you, to bless the work of your hand. And we're looking to the employer to do that. They cannot. When God gives a promise, only God can fulfill that promise. Look up to God and he will fulfill the promises he has made. I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. I will bless them that bless thee. That's enough to, to remove fear from anybody's heart. And curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God has given us promise today. Whenever we are called by God, it's not calling us to shame. It's not calling us to destruction. It's not calling us unto condemnation. He is calling us to inherit promises. Promises. Great promises in the spiritual realm. In the physical realm. In the social realm. As well as in the mental realm. In all areas of our lives, the Lord is calling us unto blessings and um, is calling us unto things that will profit us in our lives. Just look at one of the passages where God promises much in the world. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28, reading from verse 1. And it shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken, that's the condition, diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God. These promises are not fulfilled as to just stay free and uh, miss Bible study, not reading the Bible not obeying the Lord. No, the promises don't get fulfilled in that way, but you must hearken. That's what the word says. That means lazy. Diligently. That means attentively. Wholeheartedly. Considering what you are hearing. And then to observe. To do. 
all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. That's how promotion comes. These are promises of God. When God calls us, he also gives promises. All these blessings shall come on thee. Can, I, uh, can you see that God is, is calling you uh, to blessing? It's not calling you to shame or to destruction or to condemnation or even to poverty. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, even for your animal. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. If they come only one way and they flee seven ways, who is chasing them? The angels of the Lord. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and it shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God Givest thee, the Lord shall establish thee, and holy people, not a sinful people. The Lord is not interested in establishing sinful, wretched, uh, weak uh, people who are yielding to temptation every day. But the Lord shall establish thee, and holy people, unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. Not we afraid of the people of the world, they shall be afraid of thee. The witches of the land shall be afraid of you. All the wicked people of the land shall be afraid of you, because that is the word of the Lord. God has made that promise, and not a devil can change it. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods. That's in the material realm, the physical realm. God is interested in uh, your physical well-being. In every area of your life. In the fruit of thy body. And in the fruit of thy cattle. And in the fruit of thy ground. And in, in, the, in the land with the lost way unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. Has that heavenly treasure run dry? No still full of blessing for you and for me. The heavens to give rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Mark that in your Bible. If you have been borrowing, that's not a blessing. If you say, I am in debt, that's not a blessing. But if you say, I have sufficient, and I even have to give to others, that will be a blessing. And the Lord shall make thee head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Which means... Remain separated from sin, from idolatrous worship, from the world, and from anything that will not bring glory unto the Lord. And there is blessing. We're told in um, Genesis chapter 12, from verses 4 to 6, the obedience of Abraham. Well, this obedience is because of his faith. He believed God. And when you believe God, it affects your thoughts. If you believe the promises of God, it will affect your thoughts on prayer. When problem strikes, when trouble comes, when temptation arises, when you actually believe God, you will have faith. And then you will pray. 
then it will affect your words, what you say. It will show whether you are believing or not. There is nothing like believing in the heart and then speaking words of unbelief. No. The heart and the mouth, they will agree together. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And then your plans will be affected by your faith. When you have faith, you are not planning to fail. When you are planning to fail, you don't have faith. When you have faith, you are planning to succeed. You are planning to do well because your faith affects your plan. And then your behavior is affected by your faith. Your actions are affected and controlled or directed by your faith. Abraham believed God. It affected his thoughts, his plan, his action, his behavior. We're told in Genesis chapter 12 verse 4, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. As the Lord had spoken unto him. You find out what has the Lord spoken unto you on salvation. Then act on that. What has the Lord spoken unto you concerning healing? Then pray. Stand on those promises as the Lord has spoken unto you. What has the Lord spoken unto you on evangelism? On reaching out, then do as the Lord has said. If you have faith in God, Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls, meaning the servants, the people that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. They went forth to go. He did not know where he was going. Faith directed him. The Lord just said, I will take you to a place I will show thee. He had faith. And there are people in the Bible. We will not have time to go through the passages, but I just remind you that as the body is dead without the spirit, so also is faith without works. Faith without corresponding action. We're told that um, Noah believed God and he moved with fear and he built an ark. His work, his occupation, his building of the, on, of the ark depended on his faith. We're told about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, that he staggered not at the promise of God. He did not consider his own body now dead, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he believed that what God had promised he was able to perform. That means his thought had been changed by his faith. In his thought, he did not consider his body as dead. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, we are told, as it is written, I have believed, so have I spoken. That means that your language, your words are affected by your speech. Paul the Apostle had been in the sheep uh, for many days. And the people in the sheep had been uh, fasting because they were afraid they would all die. But an angel of the Lord appeared unto Paul. And uh, that strengthened him. And he said, Sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe it shall be as it has been told me. That affected his action. He, he started to eat. And then he encouraged others to eat. We're told of the woman in Mark chapter 5. Who had suffered 12 years. But when she heard of Jesus. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God she heard of Jesus. That brought about faith in her heart. And that faith affected her words. And she said, she said in her heart, If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. But faith not only affected her words, it affected her action. She rose up. And she went unto Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And instantaneously she was made whole. And Jesus told that woman in the midst of all the people, she said, he said, Daughter, be of good cheer. Thy faith has made the whole. Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 18 was experiencing difficulty and um, he was being opposed but the Lord appeared unto him in the night and told him that he had many people in Corinth 
and that made him, that changed his plan. Even though he might have been thinking to leave Corinth before, he stayed one and a half years there. Faith will affect your plan. Faith will affect your words. Faith will affect your behavior and your actions. And faith will affect your thoughts as well. Abraham believed God. And that affected everything about his life. Our whole manner of life is inseparably, inseparably connected with the measure of faith we are exercising in the Lord. And uh, Abraham started to worship God in Genesis 12 from verse 7 to verse 8. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. He builded an altar unto the Lord. In verse 8 we are told also, in the latter part of verse 8, there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. We started with the call of Abraham. God called him. And we're ending up with that verse 8 that Abraham also called on the name of the Lord. The Lord has been calling you, calling you to separation, separation from sin, separation from idol worship, separation from the world, separation from anything that you have been doing which will not bring glory unto the Lord. Believe God. Respond to that call. Change your thoughts. Change your plans. Change your behavior. And say, Lord, I surrender. And we're told in the word of God that he came unto his own. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, he gave power. He gave right. He gave the privilege to become the sons of God. Even as many as believed on his name. And Jesus Christ said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. And the word of God says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation, because this is the day of salvation. This is the day of blessing. Call ye upon the name of the Lord. God called Abraham. Abraham responded, and Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved shall be saved, shall be saved, and you can be saved tonight. You can be saved tonight. If you'll call upon the Lord, if you'll call upon the Lord and say, I forsake my ways, I forsake my sins, I forsake my evil ways, I forsake my idols, I forsake the world, I forsake anything that will not bring glory unto the Lord, here am I, here am I, and the Lord will receive you. I want you to stay quietly where you are and don't move at all. This is a solemn moment. Whether you are an usher or anyone, don't move in this place of meeting now. Right now you can have the opportunity of God himself, not an angel. God himself, writing your name in the book of life. Just right now. You don't know tomorrow. You don't know the future. The future for the unbeliever is black. And you don't want to leave this place as an unbeliever. For the believer, it is bright. For the believer, glorious days are coming. But if you're an unbeliever here tonight, I don't want you to go away from here without giving you a chance for your name to enter into the book of life. So if you, if you are separating from sin, separating from idol, separating from the world, and separating from anything that will not bring glory to God, and you want to make your face public, where you are just raise up your hand and say, I believe Jesus died for me. And I want to confess Christ tonight. I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. Where you are, just raise up your hand. Raise it up well so I can see. As you raise up your hand, tell the Lord, I separate from sin. Tonight, right now, I separate from sin. I have nothing to do with sin anymore. And right now, I assure you, according to the promise of God, that cannot change. 
God will write your name in the book of life if you truly repent and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I see more hands? If you know you are a sinner, you know you are a sinner, and you know that you don't want to die a sinner, you've had the call of God tonight. Press up your hand where you are and say, Lord, I give myself to you. God, I give myself to you. God, I give myself to you. We come to you boldly, not trembling, not fearing, not guessing, not thinking. We come to you boldly, knowing that you will save, knowing that you will forgive, and knowing that this is the time, this is the moment, this is the day. You see all these people who are standing up. They came here tonight to be saved. They came here tonight so that their names will be written in the book of life. Save them in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe. They believe. The believers say, I believe that Jesus Christ died for them. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, this moment, they are washed whiter than snow. Father, we pray that the spirit of the living God will apply the blood of Jesus and cleanse them from all sin right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Bear witness with their hearts now Amen. that they are children of God, Amen. that they are free from sin, Amen. that their names are written in the book of life. Amen. We believe and so we have spoken. They believe and so they have risen up. Thank you for saving them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Father, we thank you for what you have taught us tonight. We praise your name because you have stretched forth your hand, the hand of mercy. You've called us, called to separation unto every one of us. And Father, we thank you because everyone that has heard this message tonight has been blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe it and we confess it. That all of us here tonight, we have heard your word and we will not be the same anymore in Jesus' name. Amen. A change has come upon every one of us tonight. New life has come upon every one of us tonight. New life in the spirit, in the heart, in the soul, and in the body, and in all that we touch. Right now, Father, we thank you because you have given us power and authority to be able to obey you and to be able to do your will. Thank you because you have blessed us tonight. May this blessing remain with us. And may our separation from sin, from idols, from the world, and from anything not bringing glory to you, may that separation remain permanent in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go back home, protect us. Amen. Watch over us. Amen. Let your hand be mighty upon us. Amen. And let the blood of Jesus be a hedge around every one of us. Amen. And from today, may our worship be acceptable unto you. Amen. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.